they each have my name on them. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what it means if NASA you put your name on a patch? It's like a ticket to get on a spaceship. <laughs> it means you're going to have a lot of fun. I would like to talk about all four missions, but as Mark mentioned, we have a limited amount of time. I'm going to focus on the fourth mission. Uh, this was Expedition 12, so Roman numeral 12, to the International Space Station. Now, if you notice, there are only two names on this patch. Mine and Russian Air Force Colonel Valery Ivanovich Tokarev. Why only two people? Well, we flew and during a period of time following the Columbia tragedy when the shuttle fleet was grounded. Uh, by the way, uh, the, the 20th uh, anniversary of that uh, just horrible day uh, was just the first of this month. So it's been 20 yeah, years since we right. lost seven of our closest friends. But mm -hmm. uh, because the shuttle fleet was grounded, Valeri and I flew on board the Russian Soyuz rocket. And here the rocket is being elevated, being erected at the pad. This pad is called Gagarin Start because it's the same launch pad from which Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to fly in space in 1961. April 12th will be the 62nd anniversary of Gagarin's flight. Well, I'm happy, you know, even though it's a Tuesday, I'm happy to see a few young people out here. Because human spaceflight really is about the future. It's about a better future for the young people in our, in our lives. <laughs> you adults look pretty young to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty confident that the average age in here is significantly less than 62 years. As a matter of fact, the, the average age of, man, uh, of humanity is significantly less than 62 years. You know, that means most people have never known a time when human beings didn't fly in space. So here we are out at the launch pad um, early in the morning. Valeria and I are going up the stairs uh, to get aboard the Soyuz. Three. There weren't three names. Does anyone know how to say stowaway in Russian? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll talk about that in a second. We're launching from Kazakhstan. Not here in Florida, not Russia, but yet another country, Kazakhstan. Five, have a four. There. Oh, yeah, but they don't speak English there. Dva, Adin, Zajaganya. Yes, we mean politiki, no, we see some tomorrow. Yeah, I'm going to have to go down to the other people. Da. 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 If you fly on board a Russian spacecraft, you're obligated to speak Russian and not badly. Imagine that. Jeez. So here we are in mid-flight. It really was that smooth. In eight and a half minutes, we go from the launch pad to 17,500 miles an hour. Woohoo! Five miles a second. That's pretty fast. Jeez. <laughs> it is. It is a lot of fun. Now the answer is, <laughs> and suddenly you're weightless. You know how to tell the rookies on the crew? Well, our rookie would let it go of his pen and said, it really does float. Yeah. <laughs> now, Larry and I were veterans. Guess what we did? We let go of our pens and said, the physics didn't change. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm in the left seat. Uh, Larry's in the center seat. I turn to my right, shake his hand, say congratulations, and look at his right, and there's our stowaway. Okay, clearly not a stowaway. Uh, he's got his own space suit, the American flag on it. G. Olson. This is Dr. Greg Olson. Uh, Greg is a New Jersey businessman, scientist, engineer, inventor. I know he's a good engineer because we trained together for six months and we spent 10 days together on orbit. And he was every bit as confident as a professional astronaut. About the business part. Well, Greg invented technology in the area of fiber optic communication and infrared imaging. He then started companies to manufacture and market his invention, inventions, and then he sold those companies for a lot of money. It's so hard. much so that he, with the pocket change, he paid the Russians over $20 million to fly in space. Wow. Oh. I mean, really. Okay, so where are we headed? The International Space Station. This is what it looked like when we got there. 
Might look big, but it was small compared to, compared to today. Remember what it looks like here? Because I'm going to show you a picture of what it looks like in its, uh, when it was complete. Okay, so we spent two days just flying the Soyuz, getting our orbiter orbit synchronized with ISS. And so for those two days, we had a lot of free time. So we just took our spacesuits off, stretched out, relaxed, looked out the window and enjoyed all the all the, all the room inside the Soyuz. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I, I'm going to give you, a, you know, for anyone who thinks they might want to be an astronaut, I'm going to give you an inside claustrophobic. tip. If you're claustrophobic, it's not a good idea. <laughs> so, um, here we are approaching ISS. We're right in the middle section of the Soyuz. Who took this picture? ISS. Okay, close. We're the Expedition 12 crew. We were there to replace the Previous Expedition crew. 11 crew. Sergey Prikolov from Russia, John Phillips from the US. We spent eight days doing a handover. What do I mean by handover? Now for all you adults, remember when you went to your first job and that veteran, that experienced employee put their arm around your shoulder and said, Forget everything they taught you in school. I'm going to show you how we really do it. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit, that's, that's sort of like a handover. Now, seriously though, um, our training on the ground is really quite good, but the equipment on which we train functioned differently in weightlessness. And so the veteran crew showed us all those little differences, a little eccentric, eccentricities in the, uh, and the equipment on orbit. Now they've left. Larry and I have been training for four years. Oh wait, wait, I got a question. Um, young people out there, how many of you have bought a souvenir? Ooh, I'm worried. Moms, dads, they need souvenirs. No, I do not get a percentage of the profits in the gift shop. <laughs> but they're going. To, I'm sorry, kids. You're going to go back to school, right? And when you do, a well chosen souvenir can be a great show and tell item to help explain to your teachers and your classmates the things that you see and learn today. Now, as I mentioned, Greg paid a lot of money to find space. Do you think he got a good souvenir? He did. He got to keep the Expedition 11 Soyuz. He got to take his spaceship home with him. What was that? Would you like to see it? Sure. Go to New York City. <laughs> Remember, Greg lives in New Jersey. The Expedition 11 Soyuz is on display in the USS Intrepid. The USS Intrepid mm. Sea, Air, and Space Museum. They were a retired U.S. Navy mm. aircraft carrier, which is docked at one of the piers on the Hudson River in Manhattan. Mm. The Expedition 11 Soyuz is on display on the hangar deck. Okay, they've left. Larry and I have been training for four years. We have a lot of work to do, most of which is inside. Here I am photo documenting the behavior of a liquid to see how it's separated into its two components in weightlessness. On the ground, the scientists were photo documenting the same liquid to see how it's separated in the presence of gravity. But every once in a while, we got to go outside. Here we are donning our EMUs in preparation to perform an EVA. Hmm. Let me try it again. Here we are donning our extravehicular mobility units in preparation to perform an extravehicular activity. Uh, okay, I see a few puzzle faces still. We're putting on our spacesuits to go outside and go spacewalk. Okay. Um, so these are these spacesuits were designed for use by the shuttle during the shuttle program. And, and the shuttle crew was five, six, or seven people. And so there were always extra people to help put the suit on, don it, and doff it, take it off. It's so it difficult off. to do that no crew in which only two people were on the spaceship like Valeria and I had ever done a spacewalk in these suits. And no one has been in that situation since then. We were, we were getting way behind on the work that needed to be done outside 
to prepare to continue building the International Space Station. We say spacewalk, but of course we don't walk. Here we are translating hand over hand. We're actually on the underside of the, of the, of the uh, P3, uh, I'm sorry, P1 truss, port side truss. The earth is actually up here. Huh. Hmm. What would happen if you fell off? <laughs> Could you fall? No, which means you're floating, but you could drift away. And if you do, you can't walk by the way. We're a solid Cats swim back. camera, weighing 200 pounds. I had been pumping iron. And <laughs> pumping but anyhow, but if you drifted away, you couldn't walk, swim, or fly back. So we have something called a safety tether. tether. And here you can see this cable. It goes to a self-retracting reel attached to the spacesuit with a belt. It's very much like a self-retracting dog leash. And so if you slipped off, if you lost your grip, it would pull you back to the point to which it's been put. All right. Unfortunately, after oh about uh, five and a half hours, we had to come back inside and continue our experiments. <clears throat> Going outside is a lot of fun. It's hard work, it's a lot of fun. In this one, Valeri grew green beans. Um, now, I think growing things is cool. I was raised on a tobacco and cotton farm in North Carolina. So why didn't I become a farmer? Well, let me tell you what my summers were like. I worked in the tobacco fields, of course. I drove a mule-drawn sled, about eight feet long, three feet wide, three feet high. I would walk beside the sled with the reins going up and down the rows of tobacco. The field hands would crop the tobacco, break the leaves, break the mature leaves off, fill the sled. I'd drive the sled to the barn. We'd offload it, begin uh, uh, processing the tobacco leaves for market. I would return to the fields, repeat, repeat, repeat. And so I describe my summers as hours in the hot sun looking at the south end of the northbound mule. <laughs> I decided, oh, funny. To, I decided to head in a different career direction. <laughs> Anyhow, so we've got these green beans, fresh vegetables. How cool is that? But you know what the problem is, right? We've all seen the science fiction movie. The astronaut goes to their little garden in the space station, go pick some lettuce leaves, go pick some salad, get there and find out that the lettuce has mutated. He's <laughs> the astronaut instead. <laughs> yep. Okay, that is science fiction. But the scientists did want the beans back on the ground to analyze their nutritional value, so they told us hands off. But uh, nutrition on orbit is important. By the way, this is the most this is the most important tool on board the space station. What are these? Scissors. Why would scissors be important? Because I need them to open the smoke truck. <laughs> well, Larry will use his to open the mashed potatoes with onions. We also had green beans with mushrooms and a cranberry apple cobbler for dessert. Uh -huh. Earth, potatoes, green beans, something with cranberry. What meal do you think this might have been? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, absolutely. The lady's a member of the Russian Orthodox Church. My ancestors were kicked out of Scotland during the Highland clearings when my peasant ancestors were forced off the land so that the landowners could raise more sheep. So my, my ancestral upbringing was in the Presbyterian church. So we each said grace in our native languages. Uh, meals were a great time for sharing our cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. Now, Valeria's got those green beans with mushrooms. They would be hydrated. You've got to add water. If you don't add enough, they won't stick to the spoon. <laughs> Unfortunately, Santa does not have uh, spacesuits for his reindeer. So he used a Russian Progress resupply vehicle to deliver our Christmas presents. Aww. Yes, we celebrated the holidays in space, and it was so cool. But there's something unusual here. Mm -hmm. What character do you see right here? Santa. Santa. Um, Russian what's is this look like? Christmas tree. Christmas tree. 
But Larry's grandson, Evgeny, does not see that. Russians do not celebrate Christmas on uh -huh. December 20th, uh, 25th. And so Yevgeny sees Jed Maroon's Grandfather Frost, uh -huh. who brings gifts to good boys and girls on New Year's Eve. And so this is a New Year's tree and New Year's stockings, if you're in Russia. And the Russian Orthodox Church celebrates, observes uh, uh, Christmas as a purely religious uh, celebration on January 7th. Now, um, not only is, uh, oh, wait, 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 I do have a question. Um, you young people, I want you to imagine that you have a friend on board the space station and you want to send her a Christmas present. Or maybe it's her birthday, you want to see it send her a birthday present. Or maybe she's your girlfriend Ooh. and you want to send her a, pre a Valentine's Day present. Think of something that's really, really important that she must have. Not nice to have. Think. Not convenient to have. Uh, you know, you can, you can, for example, you can go a long time without <laughs> like shampooing, but we do have shampoo over there. CD so what is something songs. really, really important that your friend must have and it would be a great Christmas present? Any ideas? So Music from home. How about oxygen? That would be nice. Oh, any other ideas? Water. Water. And food. Food, real you food. You live about three minutes without oxygen, about three days without water, and about three weeks without food. And it all comes from the ground. And what we get up there, we're very careful to get as much use out of it as we can. As a matter of fact, we recycle over 90% of the water. That's a good <laughs> You know what that means, though. <laughs> <laughs> that means the coffee you drank this morning was made with the same water as the coffee you had two weeks ago. It only changed color twice. Okay. <laughs> exercise is also important. Here on the ground, we exercise by resisting gravity, right? Walking, running, jumping, uh, playing sports, it, it's all about uh, working against gravity. And so since gravity is not going to help us exercise in space, we have to have, we have, to have compensation. So here you can see Larry wearing a harness attached to rubber bungees, which pull him down against gravity. the treadmill deck with a force equivalent to his body weight. Here I am riding a bicycle. Okay, bicycle is two wheels, so this is really a cycle ergometer. It simulates riding a bike. It's got pedals and cranks, and I can adjust the resistance, so you know, maybe it's a 1% climb, a 2%, 5%, when if I really wanted to suffer, 10%. They just would never give me the code to put it in close downhill mode. <laughs> Lifting weights at 500 pound barbell would look really stiffy in space and it would be absolutely useless. So we have this resistive exercise device. We just uh, set the tension of these cables, attach a bar, I can do curls, bench presses, lots of exercise. And we do that not only to maintain health, but also we need to maintain our strength and endurance when we do more spacewalks. Here Valeri is in the hatch wearing the Russian Sokol. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Orlon space suit. Now, it's, it's extremely rare uh, for uh, people to do the space suit in both types of, uh, do a spacewalk in both types of space suits on the same mission. And so Valeria and I are often asked to prepare the two suits. And I point out to people that the environment that we're being protected from is the same. The work is essentially the same. Therefore, there are more similarities and differences in the suits. And just like in the US suit, you need to be very, very careful as you move hand over hand because getting in a hurry can cause problems. And, and that's a little too fast. I think you appreciate now why that safety tether is so important. There is no safety tether. Hmm. Houston, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm here. That must be the other dude. John Smith. Oh wait. There was no Smith on that what well, Larry called him Ivan Ivanovich. There was no John or Ivan on the patch. So what's going on here? Well the US has about a dozen spacers. 
and so when, when we uh, periodically, we'll, we'll bring them down uh, from the space station, refurbish them on the ground, replace them with one out of our ground inventory, and that cycle repeats. When the Russians are finished using the spacesuit on orbit, they put it in the progress, which is how we dispose of our trash or garbage, which works up in the atmosphere. They are built, they're continually building new suits and send them up, use them for a couple of years. So we had an extra suit. <laughs> we stuffed it full of dirty clothes and towels. And if you notice, you couldn't see what was going on behind the solar panel. And so Valeria went out and jettisoned it. And when he did, I keep the bike and I said, help! <laughs> 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 you're such a you're troublemaker. Such, you're such a good audience. You're so polite. Troublemaker. Um, but I'm just skeptical after it when I hear that. I love the question, did you really? No, you did not really. Um, so about 90% of what I told you is true. Um, we did stuff it full of dirty clothes and towels. Uh, Valeria Jess said that I did not see the mic. Um, but we had attached a radio transmitter to it, which broadcasts a message repetitively, recorded by young people from around the world in their native languages, promoting um. world peace, harmony, and friendship. And Yvonne, uh, and, and it was broadcast on an amateur radio, a ham radio frequency. Yvonne orbited the Earth for about uh, uh, six months and then uh, burned up on re-entry. But talking about Earth, it's that big blue and white thing in the background. Uh, here's wow. a better picture. This is our home that's planet, incredible. and wow, it is, it is, it is, that, that's a wow moment. The first time you get into space and you see the Earth, it, it's, it's a very emotional thing. It, 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 uh, it affects some people differently, but most of us, it's very inspiring. And we see lots of cool phenomena. This is the moon shadow. What do we call the moon shadow on the surface of the Earth? Eclipse. An eclipse, that's right. It's the total eclipse of the sun. The track of the eclipse and our orbital track intersected over the northeast Mediterranean. We flew right through the moon's shadow. It was pretty cool. It's hurricane Wilma, 2005. Wow. A very, very active hurricane season. And we see, because of our orbital path, we see all these large storms over both the Atlantic and the Pacific. What happened in New Orleans in 2005? Mm -hmm. Katrina, you bet. The Ooh, Patagonian wow. glaciers, the southern Andes, rivers of ice flowing down mm. uh, mountain valleys. Beautiful. Cosmonauts and astronauts have taken pictures of the same geological uh, phenomena for decades. And so there are hundreds, if not thousands, of pictures of the Patagonian glaciers. And scientists can look at those pictures to, to track changes over time to help develop and anchor, in this case, climate, mo climate models. Yeah. Arwanda Crater in Chad, North Africa, 11 miles across, 17 kilometers. What makes things, and by the way, there, there, there are features like this all over the surface of the earth. Many are hard to spot because they're covered with vegetation and other things that obscure them from space. What causes something like this? Meteors. A meteor, an asteroid, a big rock hits the Earth going really, really fast. This happens about once every one million years. And a really big one struck the Earth off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, Mexico, 66 million years ago. What do we think happened after that? The dinosaurs became extinct. Okay, for you young people, if we get struck by one between now and the time you're scheduled to go back to school, you don't have to turn in your homework. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, but, uh, but seriously, it, it's why it's so important that we have a just an in-depth understanding of what's happening in our little neighborhood, our little corner of the universe. Don't lose sleep over it, please. This is a geological time scale. It's not going to happen in our lifetimes, probably. Okay. Hopefully. Now something a little more uh, close to home, so to speak. Uh, this is the Kennedy Space Center. This is Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Pad D, from which uh, Artemis launches. Uh, pad A, uh, 39A, from which the SpaceX 
uh, dragon launches and vehicle assembly building. And when you're ready to leave, your car is, car is parked right here. <laughs> <laughs> April 1st, it's not an April Fool's joke. There's another spaceship coming. Who's in it? You got it. So we were, we're 12. We replaced 11. So this must be Expedition 13. 13. Jeff Williams from NASA, Paul being brought up from the Russian Space Agency, and Marcus Pontus, the first astronaut from Brazil. Wow. Uh, one week doing a handover, Marcus joined Valeria and me in our Soyuz. Um, I'm sitting right behind this window. This is called the descent module, this bell shaped portion. It's the only part that returns to the ground. The other two pieces burn up on entry. And here you can see the descent wow. module, that little white dot. The other two pieces are breaking up and they're burning up. Six and a half kilometers down with the parachute, search and recovery helicopter says you're right on target as we descend for a gentle, soft touchdown. Oh. <laughs> what? <sighs> How did that feel? Oh, geez. So, so, you know, a lot of professions have what they think are cute expressions, although they're really quite annoying. Uh, one in the aviation business is any landing you can walk away from is a good, good landing. Um, that actually was a perfect landing. And so here you can see the Soyuz upright uh, on the steps of Kazakhstan. All that dirt and debris was kicked up by down-firing rockets which act to slow it to, to slow us down a little bit more just prior to touchdown, and of course picked up all the dirt and debris. But we could not walk. Uh, we had been in, we had been weightless for over six months, and when when you're and when you experience that, your body forgets how to respond to gravity. You can't maintain your balance, and if you try to stand up without holding on to something, you will just fall over. You absolutely cannot walk. And so initially, they just pick us up, carry us over from the spaceship, sit us down in a chair. Here you can see Valeria's uh, drinking a cup of hot tea. That's about 26, 27 degrees Fahrenheit when we landed. It felt really good after 190 days of 72 degrees. Very pleasant, but variety is nice. Uh, I was over on, the, on a satellite phone talking to my family back in Moscow. Our adventure had ended. But there are still human beings in space. So what's happening today and what do we think tomorrow looks like? Well, this is what ISS looks like today. This is the length of a football field. This is about one and a half times the width of a football field. If it was even sturdy enough to, to, to be able to, to exist in one gravity, and it can't, it would just everything would break and bend if you had it on the earth. Um, you would have to have two football fields side by side to hold it. We still go up using the Russian Soyuz and resupply with the Progress. After the shuttle program ended, we started resupplying using a SpaceX Dragon and a Northrop Grumman Cygnus. Uh, this launches uh, uh, normally from, well, you can launch from a couple of different places, uh, very often from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Anybody here from Virginia? Okay. Um, this launches from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport on the coast of Virginia near Wallops mm. Island. Think about that. Regional spaceports. There are several in the United States. Oh, and there's some in the UK, by the way. Um, and the next contract will have resupply using uh, a little space plane and a Japanese vehicle. Almost two years ago, we started launching astronauts from Pan 39A on the SpaceX uh, Crew Dragon. In a few weeks here from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, we'll launch um, a Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams on board the Boeing CST-100 Starliner. Right now, there's seven people on board ISS. Uh, three Americans, one Japanese, and uh, 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 three Russians. Why? because we want to go back to the moon and on to Mars. And we're going to do that using these vehicles. Here is Artemis One with an Orion vehicle on the top, which launched on November 16th. On a 25-day mission, it orbited the moon twice. Nobody on board. Did have some great pictures. Here's Orion. There in the mid-ground is the moon. In the background is our beautiful Crazy. planet. On December 11th, 
The Orion capsule splashed down in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of San Diego. So I'm going to get ready to take your questions, but I have one first. You don't have to answer, just think about it. How can the sky be the limit when there are footprints on the moon? So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Mark will bring a microphone, so that, that way both, both I and uh, the rest of the audience will be able to hear your question. Got a question, raise your hand. I'll come over to you. Okay, you're gonna go first, keep your hand raised. I don't know where you are. I know where you are. Do a few things, time permitting. Go ahead, what do you want to ask her? I'm just curious about downtime and what you do to entertain yourself and keep your sanity. Okay, so um, on ISS, we ostensibly work five and a half days a week. Um, full day Monday through Friday, uh, half uh, um, uh, Saturday morning, and then we have Sunday, uh, Sunday, Friday, uh, Saturday afternoon, Sunday off, and we start uh, uh, discussions with the ground again uh, Sunday right after dinner. So, but the Saturday afternoon, generally, you would volunteer to do extra work in that. Now, normally, <laughs> I, and I had something called a task list. It was things that weren't on the schedule yet, but were going to be in the, on the schedule a couple of weeks in the future. So when I had free time, I would often go to the task list thinking I could get ahead. Never could. Mm -hmm. um, but then there were some times you did, you just wanted to relax and you just wanted to hang out. And the things that were fun to do, we'd go to the windows and just watch the earth go by. We had computers that would show our ground tracks so we knew where we were. And there was a little uh, uh, ovoid shape around the, the space station, and that was the horizon. And so I knew that I, I should be able to see anything within that little, in that little area. And so if there's a uh, part of the ground, a uh, part of the earth that I was particularly interested in, I'd go look at it, take pictures of it. Also, we had two uh, amateur radio stations on board, and so I spent a lot of time uh, talking to ham uh, radio operators around the world. Um, gosh, I, I had a few movies on board. Um, it's interesting. Um, I, have, uh, I have two daughters, and they were both in their early 20s uh, by then. But the three of us were avid Harry Potter fans. And so when a new Harry Potter book would come out, we couldn't buy one and share it. We had to each get their own copy. And so we read, you know, it was funny. We were on a flight one time, and all three of us were on the plane with Harry Potter. But anyhow. Um, and so um, in, uh, around Thanksgiving at that time, um, the uh, Goblet of Fire was released in theaters. And so that Friday night, I think, my daughters went to, the, went to the show and they told me, oh, it was just wonderful, wish you could have seen it, Dad. And I said, well, you know, if NASA had any influence whatsoever, mm -hmm. they'd send a copy up here for me to watch. Mm -hmm. And so Monday morning, I, I, I was looking at all the files that had been uplinked from the ground uh, to our network, and I saw about, I think, seven files that were... Happy Days 1, Happy Days 2, Happy Days 3, you know, dot .mov, or some movie, some uh, video file. Click on the first one, and sure enough, it was Goblet of Fire. Um, the, the, they had contacted uh, the, uh, the studio, and they had, uh, and the studio said, we'll give you a copy, but we cannot mail it to you, we can't ship it to you, we can't FedEx it to you, it has to be hand carried. So two of my colleagues flew a jet out to California. Uh, they were they, they were given a copy. They they hand carried it back, and uh, and NASA had to agree as soon as they had transferred it and uplinked it, they had to destroy the, uh, the this copy. So mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of things to do. And also, I talked to a lot of people on the ground. A lot of I, I actually talked to J.K. Rowling and had a nice little conversation with her. Oh. I didn't believe Dumbledore was dead. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Were there any daily activities that you preferred to do in the weightlessness of space versus here on Earth? Stretching, sleeping, using the bathroom? Floating around? Well, <laughs> so using the bathroom, no. <laughs> using the bathroom is, you know, it's pretty convenient down here on the ground. <laughs> you have to be a little more careful. Or more. But, but anyhow, you hear that voice? and so, yeah. you know, just you know, almost anything was, almost any task was more fun 
or sometimes more challenging in space because everything floated. You know, can you imagine having, uh, having a flat tire and weightlessness? And so, you know, we've all done that. Uh, you know, it's really, it's really an old, old car. You pop the hubcap off, get the lug wrench, take the lug nuts off, put them in the hubcap, put the lug wrench down, kind of take the tire off, put the next tire on, you go down and reach for the lug nuts. Well, if you do that in space, the lug nuts aren't there anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they, they floated away. So, um, and you know, it's just that challenge of tasks that seem kind of routine on the ground and they're still routine in space, but you have to you have to compensate for the fact that when you put something down, it doesn't stay there. So you have to develop a little bit of self-discipline to secure everything. And, and, and so just being in space itself was fun. Um, you know, the things that, uh, and, and so uh, li living in space is, is, I mean, it just is, you know, outside of the, the wonderful events and associated with my family, uh, living in space is probably the, the best six months of my life. And if you did get a flat tire in space, you wouldn't even get a jack. You would. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, what motivated? Uh, sorry. Uh, what were the most challenging? What was the most challenging experience for you, and what motivated you through it? Okay, so the most challenging thing I did was try to learn Russian. <laughs> it was also the most humbling training of my entire astronaut career. Um, it, it, but it was also extremely rewarding. And you know, and part of and part of what was motivating was you know being, you know, sort of you know, the same things that motivated me, uh, the the challenge, you know, accepting a challenge, working hard, um, seeing progress. Um, now, as far as the actual flying part, physically, the most challenging thing is doing a spacewalk. It's just very, very physically demanding. The spacesuits are bulky. Uh, they are pressurized. The, uh, the U.S. spacesuit is pressurized to about point, about three-tenths of an atmosphere, so point, yeah, I mean, just about right. Uh, about three-tenths of an atmosphere of the Russian suit was, was pressurized a little bit higher. And so not only is it bulky, because it's pressurized, it's stiffer. If you, if you imagine a, the you know, clown at a kid's party is going to, uh, going to tie balloon animals, takes, a, takes that long, thin balloon, it's limp, you inflate it, it now, uh, had, you know, it now assumes its shape, and it resists bending. And so that's what the suits do. They resist bending just both due to their bulk and the fact that they're pressurized. And so a spacewalk doesn't take significant strength for the entire duration. It re requires endurance to make it through the duration. And periodically, it requires a fair amount of upper body strength. But, um, and so as far as a physical challenge, that was the most physically challenging thing. Okay, we got uh, one, two, and three here. We'll see if we can get to them all. Go ahead. So when you're doing the ham radio on the ISS, do you use your call sign or do you have an ISS call? And, and, and it was uh, it was NA1SS. And do you use voice or code or both? Um, uh, not code, because what we had, we just had two meter rigs on board. And so we did, we used, uh, we used voice and packet. Hi, uh, what would you recommend to a young person today who wants to be an astronaut? What, what's NASA looking for? What kind of skill set do you have to have? And so, and so first, even before discussing a young person who's interested in flying in space, my advice to all young people is identify something about which they are passionate. Because you, you, you can run into someone, for example, that says, I want to be an astronaut, and then you tell them, well, you need to study math, science, and engineering. <laughs> and, they, and if they don't like math, science, and engineering, but go into those fields because they think that's the path to being an astronaut, two things will happen. One is, is they won't be successful because they're not passionate about what they're doing. And secondly, they're unlikely to be very happy. So if we now have a young person who really is motivated by math, science, engineering, 
Um, the, then it is throw yourself into those things. Be the best, do the best that you can. Focus not on grades, but focus on the learning. Develop a love of learning. And, 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 and also don't just, don't think if it's not in the, in the, in right in front of your, your life's path, if it's a little bit on the side, you may say, hey, I love, I love math and science. I don't like geography. I don't like studying languages or English. Well, that's not a, that's not good because we expect astronauts to be having be very broadly be very broadly educated with a focus on uh, on math, science, and engineering. It's important that we be able to communicate. Hence, English language skills are important. Um, <laughs> if you notice, we see a lot of the Earth, so understanding uh, understanding geography and geology is important. Um, and then have a sense of adventure. Um, flying in space is, if nothing else, it's a grand adventure. And if you're not, if you don't have a sense of adventure, if you, you know, if you really like being in a nice, comfortable environment with your gadgets in hand, that's, you know, that's again, again. Being out in space might not be a place that you're particularly comfortable. Final question. So, as far as the amateur radio stuff is concerned, uh, you uh, is it there's a call sign zero uh, for the space station or is no, that a one SS? Uh, okay, so they're on all the labels on the apps. Uh, they show the space stations have a name of an ISS. I had that come about uh, as far as all that. I know is NA one SS when I was up there. The the Russian call sign was a little bit different. Was, was different, but okay. Well, there you go. Let's hear it for the SS for that. Go,